to say, so I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so I am in the middle of rehabilitation psychology postdoc fellow. So I work at the University of Kansas Medical Center uh, within the acute hospital, but also I work in the inpatient rehabilitation facility. Um, so also, also population with stroke is also one of the main population that I work with over there. Okay. So um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, having me today. And also thank you for everyone for coming. Um, today I will be talking about uh, emotional changes after stroke. Um, and before I continue, I do want to mention um, is that I know I have an accent and I also sometimes may speak too fast. So feel free, please let me know if you have any questions, if you have any trouble understanding or hearing me, um, or if you would like me to repeat certain questions, please just feel free to let me know. Can you say that again? Thank you. All right, but everyone can hear me okay? So first of all, if, uh, when I keep, uh, before I keep continuing, I do want to ask this question, right? Why is this topic important? Why do we want to talk about emotional changes after stroke? So um, one thing I do want to highlight is that our body minds, they are related. So what I mean by that is that for example, I'm um, thinking about sleep. Let's say we don't have enough sleep. Sleep is our physical need, right? We need that for survival. It's just a physical need that we have. But let's say if we don't have enough sleep, we may, on the next day, we may feel grumpy. We may feel easily anxious, sad, irritated, right? Um, that's our emotion part. But also, we may also have trouble, you know, processing information. We may need more time to find the words. Right? We may have trouble remembering information, learning new things, or paying attention, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Our body's minds, they're related, right? When our physical health may not be doing well, sometimes our emotions and our thinking skills, or sometimes you will call cognition, they, they can be impacted. And also just for more information, uh, depression actually affects uh, between like one and two thirds of uh, stroke survivors. And also anxiety affects more than 20% of stroke survivors. So that's why I really wanna talk about this topic today with you all, because it's very important to be aware of the potential emotional changes after stroke, okay? And also talking about what are something we can do with it, right? So here is just a few things that I want to highlight that I'm going to talk about. Just kind of know what to, what are some things we'll be, I'll be talking about and uh, with you all. And also want to mention at the end, I will also leave some space and time for everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Uh, we do have some time at the end for that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is how can a stroke affect emotions. I'm also going to talk about some common emotional responses. Uh, reactions after stroke, like grief, depression, anxiety, um, flat effects. Also, there's something called pseudo-ball effects. Tips for some cope, uh, tips for coping with stroke. Um, some tips for survivors. Some tips for family, friends, and even loved ones. Um, also, there's some tips for everyone. Now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how can the stroke affect emotions. Okay. So um, emotions may be hard to control, especially right after stroke. Okay. It's very common sometimes people do experiencing difficulty regulating emotions, having some emotional reactions after stroke. I do want to highlight that it's a very normalized, normal uh, reaction. Okay. I'm not trying to minimize. I do understand that those emotional reactions can be awful, very can be challenging, but also I want to normalize that it does happen very uh, frequently after having a stroke. So um, and why that happened is because stroke impacts our brain, and our brain controls the behavior, our behaviors, our emotions. 
right? And um, some changes, they may be results from the actual injury or the chemical changes um, uh, uh, to the brain caused by the stroke, okay? Uh, but also, some of the other things can be some normal reaction that we have uh, to the challenges we face, to um, the fear and frustrations that someone may feel trying to deal with all the effects of the stroke. Uh, because a lot of the time after stroke, um, I kind of call that an adjustment period. There will be an adjustment period because it depends on the, the, uh, the actual injury, where's the injury of, uh, to the brain, but also there can be an adjustment period, which is Basically, uh, we are trying to be aware, understanding what's the deficits, what are some impairments we have, what are something that we can do, what are something we can do to compensate for it. Um, all this kind of thing is an adjustment, right? Even initially, when we are in the hospital, we are adjusting to the new environment in the hospital. Hospital is not home, right? I understand that. And even that is an adjustment itself. Um, so, and, and then later on, as things progress, or um, when you go to different program, everything is a change, right? I would say normally, most people, we don't really like changes. And when there's a lot of changes going on, it can be overwhelming, right? Um, so sometimes those are some very normal reaction. And our stroke can also lead us with upsetting kind of body changes that take away some of our independence. So for example, some people, they may feel like, you know, feel very sad or feel very angry about the loss of the lifestyle they used to have. Um, and also some people may feel isolated by the speech and language problems. And some people may also be frustrated uh, by the slow Piece of recovery, right? We always want things to move forward, move faster, move faster than we want, right? Uh, sometimes we may also worry about the prognosis. What's the future look like? What's my life going to look like? How, what's going to look like for my family even, right? One thing I always want to highlight when we talk about adjustment, a lot of time we may also be kind of focus on the physical mobility deficits, the adjustment related to that. And I'm not minimizing it, but also I do want to emphasize when we talk about adjustment, there's also something called psychosocial adjustment. Basically, it's not only the physical part, but our emotional changes. And also, sometimes there may be a shift of responsibilities. Like, for example, maybe you need your family and friends and to help you with billing or financial support. We may need to help have some family members or friends to help us with grocery shopping. Right? There will be maybe some shifts of those roles. And our family members, they also may have to take more responsibilities. Those are the things that also is an adjustment. So that's what I'm talking about when we talk about adjustment. That's not only the physical part, but also around it, the psychosocial adjustment. Okay? Um, and then, um, so as I said, I want to talk a few more about like the common emotional reactions. So some common emotional reactions after stroke, um, they may include um, grief, depression, uh, or sadness, frustration, anxiety, anger, apathy, or what we sometimes we call it not caring with what happens, or some lack of motivation. Okay. Uh, one thing I another thing I do want to highlight is that everyone may experience emotions um, very differently. So for example, my experience of sadness could be very different from your experience of sadness, can be different from your experience of sadness, right? Um, and also everyone could have very different emotional reactions after strokes. So these are just some common emotional reactions that uh, stroke survivors, they tend to have. It does not mean that all stroke survivors, they have to, they should have any of this reaction, right? Before I move on, any, just want to take a quick check-in, any questions, any problems, issues? And now I'm going to start talking about some common emotional reaction, okay? So the first one I want to talk about is grief. So for many survivors, a stroke is it can be life uh, altering, it can be life changing, and it can involve different kinds of losses. And this may be certain abilities, such as the ability to talk, ability to walk, 
um, they can be compromised. Even though um, you know a rehabilitation, right, that can be uh, help restore many abilities. Um, this also took time, took consistency, patience, right. Um, it also took a lot of effort. Um, and survivors may sometimes feel a sense of loss around, you know, uh, their old life, abilities, dreams, and even a sense of identity. All right. Um, and while, while we talk about, talk about grief, I do want to highlight um, Dr. Kubur Ross. Her five, uh, she, she developed this framework called as the five stages of grief. Okay. And the stages of grief, they are often experienced in outer quarter. And, and this journey will can look very different for different people. Um, but typically, the stage one is what we call denial. So what happened is that a stroke can, as I said, like stroke can be life altering and um, and can completely change someone's aspects of life and uh, for both actually, for both survivor, but also maybe for family, friends, loved one. And after the initial complication of stroke, um, sometimes uh, have sometimes after the initial complication of of uh, being treated, um, sometimes we may have moments or even days of uh, denial. What that means is that we may kind of try to change our, or have a disbelief that this stroke has happened, right? We don't want to believe that have happened, and denial is a very common sign, uh, uh, a common reaction after stroke. Um, and and even though it's very common, one thing I do want to emphasize is that it can be a major obstacle. Um, because when we are uh, drink, especially during the recovery process, because when we are not uh, noticing what's going on, noticing what's the uh, deficit of impairment, sometimes that may also impact whether uh, what our reaction after, right? Whether we are going to go to see our doctors, whether we are going to, you know, do things to compensate with the impairments because we do want to have the insight, we call our awareness of this is what's going on going on so that we can do something with that, right? But without the, 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 the insight or awareness, sometimes we may not do things too accordingly to adjust to the deficits or impairment. And then um, also um, in uh, the stage two, it's called, I'll be called, we name it as anger. So anger after stroke can be triggered by different factors, right? Um, a survivor, uh, sometimes we may feel frustrated about uh, the everyday tasks suddenly may take more time, more effort, more patience. Um, and sometimes there may also be other stressors, like sometimes there can be maybe limited insurance coverage, uh, maybe a change in independence, or like earlier what I see, maybe a change of like family roles, responsibilities. Those stressors, they can also induce anger. In stage three, it's bargaining. So if uh, when that occur, we may start, what that means is that we may start making try to stick deals with like higher power um, through some kind of statement. Like for example, this may sounds like if only I could move my leg again, um, and then I would be a better person. And this stage can also be very difficult for, uh, for, for us to navigate as because survivors may feel like they could have avoided the stroke if they, do, they did certain thing. Okay. Um, but also since the stages of grief, like what I said, they are not linear, uh, it's well possible that some people, they actually skip this stage. Okay. And also sometimes people also find themselves uh, revisiting this stage over and over. Uh, but also, but actually sometimes it can inspire action because, because the results are made through action. And if bargaining with like a higher power helps motivate us to participate in rehab, this actually could be a positive, productive stage of grief, okay? And the stage four is depression. So I'm going to later talk a little bit more about the post-stroke depression, but in general, post-stroke depression, the effects, uh, as I said, the effects one-third of stroke survivor at any one time. And this is very common in people who have had, had a stroke. And it's uh, sometimes they, uh, people it's described that as like, feeling helpless, hopeless, um, or sometimes you feel very irritable um, and changes, and, and there can be a changes in our appetite, our sleep. Uh, we may feel loss of interest in doing things that we used to enjoy. 
And um, the last stage is stage five, which is acceptance. So acceptance is basically we have started, we have accepted, you know, this is my current situation and that I find my new normal, okay? Um, we will find ourselves becoming accepting towards the recovery journey. We know that the progress will continue and will require hard work, will require patience, will require time. Uh, but then also we also accept that this is where I am at right now. And I'm eager to also keep moving forward to participate in rehab, doing things to help me move forward. Right. So this is all the five uh, stages of grief. And when we think of grief, I do want to mention we often may think about you know the loss of our loved ones. And because that's usually how how grief was related or tied to. But and, and the grief in terms of after stroke, they can be very similar to the grief related to when we lost a loved one. But also there's one thing that is very different is that, uh, which I want to highlight is that the deficits, the issues, the impairment itself, they can be a constant reminder of the loss of functions. That's very different from when we lost a loved one, right? When we lost a loved one, I don't know if anyone has lost a loved one, but when we lost a loved one, we may, oh, went to certain places or some photos remind us of that. But after stroke with the loss of functions, that impairment itself, because it as part of our body, it was, it's with us 24 seven. It's a constant reminder, right? So that's the one thing I do want to highlight. I know it's, it's, it's just what that one thing, but it's, it can make a very big difference between the grief uh, after stroke and the grief after the loss of okay. So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about depression. As I said, I was going to talk a little bit more about. So depression, again, as I said earlier, one thing I, I want to, again, highlight and emphasize, everyone can experience the uh, emotion differently, including depression. So this is just some common symptoms that people tend to may have when they are in a depressed, low mood, or having uh, experiencing some depression. So some symptoms they may have is uh, they may feel sad, they may feel anxious, they may feel empty, uh, they may feel restless and irritable. Uh, people may feel hopeless, feel guilt, feel like they're worthless, or feel helpless. Right? And sometimes people may lose interest. They don't want to do things that they enjoy doing. One thing I do understand, I do want to normalize, I understand maybe after stroke, like what we talk about, we may need to, there's something we may used to do, we may enjoy doing, we may not be able to do anymore at the moment after stroke, right? Uh, but we, we want to, what we want to do is that we want to, okay, let's try to see if there's any new things we may even want to try, right? Because sometimes without trying, we don't really know what we enjoy. And, um, and sometimes the loss of interest is even losing things that we want to, we can do. We want uh, um, even maybe watching TV, listening to music, or talking to people, um, things that we can still do, but we may also lose that interest of doing those things. Mm -hmm. right? And also we may feel, uh, feel very tired all the time, even we have enough sleep, like we just somehow feel not having the energy. Uh, we may sometimes also have trouble concentrating, remember things, making decisions. We may have sleep difficulties. We may it may change our appetite and even our weight. Uh, and and also some people even may thought of suicide, may thought of hurting themselves. So those are some common symptoms, right? And also again, again, I want to go back earlier and talk about how the body mind related. If you look at those common symptoms, some of them they are physical. Right. Um, so that's why when we are, that's why I earlier mentioned about how our bodies, minds, they're related. Because even when we are depressed or we, when we're in a low mood, actually, we do have some people have those physical symptoms as well, like poor appetite. Okay. Or sometimes people actually overeating in a opposite way. And um, so another thing I want to, another reaction I want to talk about is um, anxiety. So uh, again, this is just some common symptoms of anxiety, but anxiety is an overwhelming sense of worry and fear. It can include uh, increased uh, sweating or heart rate. Uh, sometimes people feel, uh, 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 but amongst uh, stroke survivors, as I said, anxiety is very common. And often people sometimes even experience both depression and anxiety. 
Okay. And um, some common symptoms they are like ongoing worrying, fear, feeling restless, irritable, um, feeling low energy, having poor concentration, um, uh, muscle feel very tense. Up. Um, for example, like for me, when I'm like stressed, my muscle can get tense up on the neck, on my shoulder. So that sometimes when we're anxious, we kind of feel the same, we may feel tense up. Um, we also may feel very, we call it sometimes you describe as like feeling panicked, or even sometimes you like they are out of breath, they are having trouble breathing. Sometimes people have this increased heart rate, they can even hear it, but their, their heart beat is raising. Um, sometimes people, sometimes people feel shaky, um, uh, feel like shaky, they or may they may they may actually physically shake. Uh, sometimes people have a headache. Sometimes people even like they call that butterfly in their stomach, right? They feel that upset stomach. So those are also some common symptoms or experience of anxiety. Again, everyone can experience anxiety very different. Um, but again, again, kind of be mindful. You may notice also there's a lot of like physical symptoms as well when we experience anxiety. So the next reaction I want to talk about is we call flat effect. Uh, sometimes people we may uh, may heard about the term flat effect. So what that means is that uh, flat effect is kind of on the other hand. So it's actually a lack of emotional responses. Um, people may show very limited or even no emotional react, react, uh, responses to anything. They may people kind of call it like kind of flat. Um, and there may be a general lack of smiling, lack of laughing, or even lack of crying and in any type of interaction. And uh, this can be actually sometimes people may mistakenly interpret that as depression, okay? And it's very important that, uh, you know, we may wanna ask our loved one, especially if a loved one who uh, uh, suffered from after stroke, we may wanna ask them, you know, how is your mood doing rather than kind of guessing from how they look like because they may be flat in the, on the upside but they actually may have other emotions inside. It's just not somehow not showing it on the face, right? Another thing, uh, another concept I want to, or reaction I want to talk about is, mm -hmm. um, I have not heard of Japan in a long case that. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to sit and remember it. It had to do with animals, the dog. And I was outside on the bench, and the dog, I've always been afraid of dogs, but it just panicked part, just a couple of inches for mm -hmm. um, With me, I initially closed my eyes and I started screaming. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what my chest or my body felt like. It just like, Something came over me, and uh, the dog was eating. He was passing, but it just something just happened that I couldn't control my emotions. Yeah, it's very common that when we are anxious, um, you know, or feel panic, um, sometimes every others. Uh, some common reaction. Some people, uh, we may run away, right? We fight. We may run away. We may try to avoid it. Some people may kind of freeze and froze there. Some people may try to fight against it, right? Um, so there's can be different reactions. And like just now, what you described to me, it's very common. Sometimes when we're anxious or feeling panic, uh, we may have uh, because of, of the intense emotional arousal. We call it suddenly we just feel very anxious, right? Um, like that's kind of related to what we talked about earlier, our body minds is related because the cognition and motion and physical, I kind of see them as triangular, right? So when our emotion is taking up so much effort and space, sometimes our cognition is not really functioning properly. So that may explain why you cannot remember some of the part because maybe at that time you, your emotion is so intense that sometimes our cognition is just not running properly at the moment so you may not remember but it's very common when we have especially when we uh, experience ex uh, something called panic attack maybe sometimes you will hear of that term uh, panic attack it's a, a, a type of anxiety um it's uh, the only, kind of only difference is that panic attacks 
usually it's a very, very uh, it's a short period of intense anxiety. Usually lasts from it can last from five minutes to thirty minutes. Uh, but also sometimes after panic attack, people may have a lingering effect, like for an, uh, even hours after. We kind of have some lingering anxiety after. Okay, so it's very common that when people feel panic, uh, again, I'm not trying to minimize, I know that's awful. Um, and if you feel like if, if, uh, you want to address that, it's important to address that, or you feel like it's very you know, impacting your day-to-day -day life, um, you may want to kind of consider maybe talk about it uh, with a professional, mental health professional, or your doctors. Okay. Yeah. And um, anything else before we move on? And thank you for sharing. So uh, yeah, so, so I was going to talk about like the pseudo bubble effect. So I don't know if anyone heard that term. It's a very uh, and it's okay if you have not. And, the, and, and I do want to mention. I know there's a, like a lot of like, medical jargon, and this is from that, unfortunately. So this is the medical. Uh, it's a neurological condition. Some people call pseudo bubble effects, and um, this is what that means is that it's actually the emotional. Uh, liability. Sometimes there's an up and down, the mood swing, and also sometimes you uh, kind of involuntarily have some emotional expression. Um, so, what us, uh, for example, people may cry or laugh, and that actually doesn't match the person's mood. So, I may feel sad, but for some reason, externally, I'm I'm laughing. Some people may laugh and feel, even though they feel sad. Or vice versa, people may be crying when they're watching some funny movie or we're hearing a joke and it doesn't match with their internal feeling. So that's the pseudo bubble effect is that very different uh, emotional expression externally and how we feel internally. And sometimes that can feel very uncomfortable. Like what, we, what I mentioned for that example, if we went to your funeral and we don't feel happy and we don't feel like we want to uh, laugh. But just somehow that's our body, how our body work at the moment. It just we just laugh, and then we may feel very embarrassed. We may feel guilty, right? Uh, we have a lot of different emotions flooding in because we laugh in a in a in a, in a setting that we don't feel appropriate with that emotions. Okay. Um, so uh, so that's why for our next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about some tips for um, coping with that cerebral impact. That's a good question. Um, it can, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, but I would say it can be very different because, the, again, the highlight is that the suitable effect is that. So, usually, when we want to assess that, we do want to ask. That's why earlier I mentioned we want to ask the person, right? How are you actually feeling? Try not to guess based on whether they have a flat effect or suitable effect. Because it can be a physiological reaction that we are showing something different externally. So I would encourage everyone, if you, especially if you know someone who has stroke, have had a stroke, you may want to instead of like, oh, just based on looking at them, ask them how their mood go away. Because the, uh, the cerebral effect of highlight is the very different emotions that they feel internally and how they express that externally. But uh, bipolar disorder is another concept that, that you know, uh, just very brief, it's very hard. Uh, very brief, basically, a bipolar disorder, there can be a mood swing as well, but usually it's consistent with how they feel when they are, um, by, bipolar disorder, usually they can have a kind of two stages, they can feel either very, very depressed, very, very low, or they can feel very, very happy, right, but usually it should uh, it kind of match with what they are feeling in their external world. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that answered the question, any other, all right. Um, you might answer it on this slide, but is it true that some people like know what's happening and some people aren't aware of it? Yeah, um, usually it takes some time. Sometimes people, they I have heard people kind of or patients describe, they kind of have a feeling that they know it's coming. They know that they're going to cry or they know that they're uh, they going to laugh. Uh, for some reason. So that's some of the tips that I'm going to talk, talk about is kind of also uh, talking about that when we notice all this. And everyone can ha kind of have a different like feeling and like, knowing when it's coming. It's it's not, it's not really a standard, oh, this is coming and everyone is the same. So kind of that's why I mentioned it kind of sometimes takes time and we slowly realize, oh, yeah, this is the sign for me when it's coming. 
Um, so the first tip is being open about it, right? When we are, I understand sometimes we don't feel, old, we, may, we may not be comfortable to tell people that, you know, this is what I'm uh, happening right now. Um, but, and if you feel comfortable, especially with your loved ones, family, friends, uh, please let them know if you notice yourself having maybe some symptoms of the super bowl of effects that I just mentioned. Let them know so that they're aware. And maybe they also want to, you may want to also seek out professional help, talking, talk to your doctors as well. But also letting people around you to know that you cannot always control your emotional expression. Explain to them that you know the emotion you show outside don't always reflect how you feel inside. Okay. Um, so sometimes telling people ahead, the people, especially the one the people that we trust, we feel comfortable with. Again, I'm not trying to minimize, I understand that conversation may not be easy, especially if it's like someone that we may not feel comfortable with. And I'm not saying that you have to tell everyone, like you know, putting a sign on your head and telling people that you have this effect. But kind of, if you feel comfortable with your loved one, family, friends, if you feel comfortable, you may, you may want to let them know ahead so that they are aware and not mistakenly interpret that as maybe you're sad, happy, right? And you may also even encourage them, like, please ask me if you wonder how I'm going to be doing, okay? Um, and also try to distract yourself. If you kind of know that it's coming, that outburst is coming, try to focus on something boring and not related. So for example, it's, um, sometimes you count the numbers of items on a shelf or count how many books they have. You know, things like that is very boring, very unrelated, but sometimes that can help uh, with the distraction, can help to manage that uh, pseudo wall effect. And sometimes also we may want to notice the posture. Uh, uh, once you find yourself maybe have that uh, super bubble effect, one of the effects is that sometimes we may cry, right? And we may want to start to notice, you know, what kind of posture may trigger or we may tend to have that crying outburst, okay? And when you think about that, uh, once you notice that, you may want to try to start like changing your posture. Um, and also, one thing, another thing is that, you know, I would always emphasize we may also want to do some deep breathing because a lot of the time, even right now as I'm talking, we tend to have shallow breathing up to our chest. Um, and actually a lot of the time we want to try to take some deep breath all the way to our belly. And when you, and if you ever try that, you want to really focus on your breathing, really quiet down and think, hear the sound of your own breath. Because when you're in a quiet environment, you actually can hear the sound of your own breath. Focusing on the sound of your own breath as you're breathing in and out, and also feel the air come into your lung and exit your lung as you're breathing. Okay, so the deep breathing can help with managing the pseudo wall effect, but also the deep breathing can be helpful uh, for us to manage our uh, our emotions when we feel stress. We can we may also want to uh, practice that to help us feel calmer. Um, and sometimes even people do that before sleep because that can be helpful for sleep as well. And uh, even for pain, some people, again, I'm not against medication, uh, but also there's some behavioral technique like a deep, uh, a deep breathing technique. Sometimes you will find it helpful to help manage stress, uh, I mean pain a little bit, okay? And also we wanna do something called muscle relaxation basically. Like what I mentioned earlier, like especially when we're anxious, our muscles tend to, tend to tense up. So we want to try to relax, focus on different part of the muscle in our body and try to relax them. We relax our forehead, relax our shoulder, um, that we tense up and that, that tense up. Okay, try to relax that. So, um, all right. So also I want to mention a few more tips for like uh, survivors. Um, so first of all, um, try to be easy, be patient to yourself. Uh, like, like what I said, I know it's not easy, uh, but also noticing that sometimes that's what our body needs. We need the time to recover and try to be easy and be patient on your, uh, with yourself. Um, try to, um, you know, um, try to let go of the mistakes that we make. Again, I'm not trying to minimize but also one thing I often want to emphasize is that we all have weaknesses, right? Um, I'm not a perfect person. I have my own strength, I have my own weaknesses, and I believe everyone else as well. Even after stroke, we do have strength and weaknesses, 
right? Please noticing those strengths and also weaknesses. And also it's okay that sometimes we make mistakes, okay? And also try to um, give yourself some credit for the progress that you have made. We sometimes we do want to focus on the current moment, focus on recovery therapy, all this kind of thing, but also sometimes we want to be back and think back how far we have come, what the progress we have made, and the celebrate those um, large and small uh, gains that we have, because that sometimes help move us forward, noticing how far we have come can motivate us to continue making progress. Also, try to make some time for things that you enjoy, like what I said earlier, I understand sometimes how part of the adjustment is that we may want to find some new things that we can do now, uh, versus because there may be some activities we may not be able to do uh, after stroke. We may want to start to think about, okay, are there any new things that I may be able to do now that I may want to try even, right? Um, and, and try to make some time for that and also try to stay active. And also we may want to join some uh, uh, a support group as well. Uh, we may want, we also want to try to continue spending time with our loved one, with our family, our friends, the social support is very important as well. We also want to, you know, uh, sometimes that it's interesting, that's how our brain works. We function better when we have a structure, when we eat at the same time, wake up at the same time, sleep at the same time, right? Um, and try to plan daily activities, provide some structure yourself, and, uh, and, and also noticing what's the purpose of that. And also set goals. You know, what are some mini goals we have, right? Sometimes it can be very overwhelming when we have a large goal and we feel kind of far away. And think about, break things down a little bit. What are some mini goals that we have? And one step at a time and measuring, noticing the progress again, like what have you accomplished? And also, um, want to also mention, I uh, want you to try to do something we call uh, positive self-talk, right? Um, again, as I said, everyone has strength and weaknesses. And I think it's very, very normal uh, when, one, uh, when one bad things happen versus 10 good things happen. Or maybe one, uh, one weakness that we have versus 10 strength that we have. It's a very normal human being uh, pattern. We tend to always focus on that one bad thing that has happened, one weakness that we have, right? And try to also notice it. Again, I'm not trying to ignore weaknesses, but also noticing, okay, what are the 10 good things that have happened today? Or even three, right? What are my strengths? If you cannot, if you have trouble identifying what's your strength, even maybe ask a loved one, ask the staff here who work with you. You know, always every people can find a uh, big and help you identify what, what they like about you, what are some strengths that you have, right? Okay? And um, also think of talk, uh, think about emotions is not always good or bad. I know often we have a label of like sadness, anger, anxiety, they are bad emotions, right? But also I do want to emphasize they are very normal emotion react of emotions that we all have, right? There's good day and bad days. There's, you know, uh, and it's very normal that we have those uh, bad days as well, okay? And um, also, if, again, like what I mentioned earlier, if you find yourself with a lot of uh, struggling with mental health, uh, or you, you feel like sometimes you feel very co uh, more comfortable uh, to talk to a third professional, a third person, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone has uh, been on the bus or on Uber or those kind of things. Sometimes we may feel more comfortable to even talk to an anonymous person because we don't really have to care who this person is. They're not our family and friends. Sometimes we feel more comfortable to talk to a professional. So you may want to talk to your doctors or talk, uh, ask for some referral or resources to refer you to maybe to seek some mental health counseling or psychotherapy to help you process that. And also try to also get some rest when you feel tired. Because like what I said earlier, when we don't have enough sleep, when we feel tired, our mood also can be impacted, right? Okay? And uh, also just a few more things, it's more uh, uh, that I want to share with other uh, family, friends, or loved one who, uh, that support us, a stroke survivor, you know, when, uh, when a person has 
who has had a stroke, they may, uh, like what I said, they may tend to have strong emotional reactions. So please remember that this are a result of the stroke um, and try not to become too upset by it or take it personal. And also don't avoid a loved one who have had a stroke uh, because the support that you can provide is very important for them for them in recovery. And also watch out for the signs of depression and anxiety that I mentioned earlier. And I'll, I'll kind of let them know, hey, you're noticing this, you may want to help them or you may want to consider to seek some professional help. And also, um, and, and also want to make sure to be aware that this response is, again, they are part of stroke and they are not being done on purpose. Okay. And, uh, and a few more thing is that we want to also uh, encourage what we find uh, uh, survivors who have stroke may have some emotional reaction. We want to encourage them to uh, encourage some non-emotional distraction. Uh, for example, uh, ask them, like, what's the weather look like? Something that or non-related to the emotion, what's going on. Sometimes that can be a distraction. And also help the person to be aware of, you know, hey, I'm noticing that, you know, looks like you are feeling sad today. It looks like you're feeling frustrated today. How, how, uh, what's going on? Okay, again, that verification with them is that really how we feel and also what's going on. Can I help with anything? And also, also please take care of yourself as well. And that's very important because uh, that's the next one last thing I want to talk about. It's tip for everyone that's related to take care of ourselves because um, a lot of the time, I don't know how many women thought of, uh, heard of the term self care, but self care, there's different definition. But overall, sometimes we define that as you know the ability to cope with illnesses and this ability to maintain health, um, and also we uh, that also include everything related to you know staying physical healthy, including like hygiene, nutrition, uh, also taking care of our emotional or mental health as well. Um, and so self-care is not equal to being selfish. I do want to emphasize that self-care is not selfishness. Uh, we do want to uh, take care of ourselves because so that we can be healthy, healthy, be well, do our function, uh, function better, and also help us to further help other people. Okay? Um, and also uh, even small, like little self-care, five minutes, two minutes, taking a break, it's better than nothing. Um, and I'll try to also make sure, make, a, make sure that self-care is a habit. We want to do that regularly and also want to and emphasize kind of like what we talked about emotions earlier. Self-care can very, look very different for everyone. We just kind of slowly want to figure out what are some things that can be helpful for us. And um, kind of uh, one analogy I want to talk about uh, is the oxygen mask analogy. Kind of thinking about, right? Uh, I don't know if anyone traveled on an airplane before, but when you're on the airplane, uh, the, uh, the, the flight attendant they often mention about, you know, please, if there the oxygen, uh, oxygen mask is off, like please put that on other people, uh, on yourself first before putting on other people, right? Because if we cannot help our, if we're not taking care of ourselves, that can eliminate the possibility that the opportunity for us to help more people as well. So it's not a selfishness, it's just helping us first and then so that we can help more people, all right? And uh, there's different type of self-care. Um, there's physical, emotional, um, social, spiritual, and professional. Um, but basically, we want to take care of ourselves in a different way, like what I mentioned about. Like physical can be just taking a shower, brushing your teeth, getting, drinking some water. Right, uh, emotional can be, you know, doing some uh, hanging out with my family, hanging out with my friends, doing something that I enjoy. Uh, and uh, those can be, uh, those can be some examples for uh, self care that I want to kind of emphasize. And um, and, and I also want to kind of um, just uh, kind of provide some resources. As I said, sometimes uh, when we feel depressed, uh, one of the symptoms is that we may uh, sometimes people have those uh, we call intrusive thoughts. We some people may thought of hurting themselves, right? Um, so one of the, uh, the 98 Society Crisis Lifeline, they provide free and confidential um, emotional support to people in uh, suicidal crisis or emotional distress. They are 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and they provide that across the United States. So I do want to mention that as a resource. Um, and also uh, the um, 
The NAMI helpline is also a free national wide uh, support service. They, they provide a lot of information, uh, resources with uh, uh, for family members, caregiver, uh, and, or people who struggle with mental health. So I also want to emphasize those are some resources uh, that can help us as well when, especially when we struggle, uh, have some uh, struggling with mental health. And if we want to learn more about stroke, I know today I'm just giving a, a very brief like talk about you know stroke and emotional changes after stroke. There are a lot of things that is related to stroke as well. If you want to learn more about stroke, uh, and also find maybe support groups, uh, that probably can go to the strokeassociation.org. Uh, you can also sign up for the stroke connection emails. Um, you can also if you want to, uh, we want to connect with other people who have similar journeys uh, with stroke, and you can also. Also join the support network. Okay. So, um, so that's kind of uh, all I have for everyone. Uh, as I said, I want to uh, have some time for everyone, and in case if anyone has more additional questions, but uh, the garden team, I do want to mention thank you so much for everyone being here and participate. Uh, and, and any questions that people may have.